So what should we make of these claims? What should we make about these anxieties, this fear that this is really all a hidden agenda to bring socialism to the United States? Well, it just doesn't add up with the facts. The US environmental movement has a long history. And if you know anything about that history, you know that its roots are not in left-wing politics, not even in democratic politics, and certainly not in socialism. But rather, its origins are found in the 1920s in progressive republicanism. In fact, Western republicanism, led by men like Teddy Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot, um, the creation of national parks, and of course, the famous communist John D. Rockefeller. Throughout the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, there was a bipartisan consensus in the United States about environmentalism, about the need to protect and preserve important, beautiful, wild places in the United States. So just to give one example, when the Wilderness Act of 1964 designated over 9 million acres of American lands as areas where man himself is a visitor and does not remain, an idea that would feel pretty, pretty radical if we were to discuss it in relation to, say, Yellowstone today, the Wilderness Act of 1964 passed the US Senate by a vote of 73 to 12, and it passed the US House of Representatives by a vote of 373 to 1. In the 1970s, the US Environmental Protection Agency was created by Republican President Richard Nixon, who signed into law several key pieces of environmental legislation that remain at the heart of environmental protection today. The Clean Air Act Extension, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, and the National Environmental Policy Act, all of which are key touchstones of environmentalism in the United States and have been for the last um, 40 years. But things did begin to change in the 1980s, and they changed in an interesting way that coincides with exactly the events that we discuss in our book. Namely, that in the 1980s, scientific evidence began to emerge in the 70s and 80s, began to emerge to suggest a deeper kind of environmental problem not just a problem that could be solved by setting aside 9 million acres of wilderness or preserving beautiful, unique places like Yellowstone and Yosemite and the Sequoia National Park and the Grand Canyon, but a kind of problem that was more pervasive, a kind of problem that wasn't just local and wasn't just amenable to a local solution like preserving the beautiful area around Grant Grove in, Yosemite, uh, in Sequoia National Park, but problems that needed broader, more engaged government action. Acid rain, the ozone hole, and global warming were all problems that required national and even international cooperation, even international forms of governance. And these issues emerged just as the Reagan administration was arguing for less government, not more, less regulation, not more. And so we see, and in the book we tell the story of how the Reagan administration began to resist the scientific evidence and how these scientists who were sympathetic to the Reagan administration largely for other reasons that actually initially had nothing to do with the environment but had to do with the Soviet Union and SDI, begin to align themselves with this anti-regulatory, less government agenda. Now, so what do we say about all this? What should we think about this confluence of events? Ronald Reagan may have had a point about the expansion of the federal government since the New Deal. There are many people who would agree with his argument that the US government, the federal government, had expanded too far. And you could agree with that point. You could acknowledge that point. But it doesn't mean that the science was wrong. And it doesn't mean that DDT and acid rain and ozone hole and secondhand smoke weren't real problems threatening the lives and health of people in the environment and needing real solutions, problems that would not go away simply by pretending that the scientific evidence wasn't there. And moreover, the allegation or the argument that if we tried to solve these problems, that it would necessarily lead to massive increase in government, loss of jobs, increased costs, that argument does not hold up to historical scrutiny. Because in the case of acid rain, which is one of the cases that we looked at closely in the book, in the 1990s, the United States government instituted an emissions trading system, a so-called cap and trade system, to control acid emissions in the industrial Midwest of the United States. It worked. Acid emissions fell, electricity prices fell, and I was just in Minnesota, so I can attest to this, people in the Midwest did not find themselves with notably less liberty than other US citizens. Moreover, we've learned a few things since 1962. The fact is that Hayek was wrong in his forecasts. Among other things, he predicted that if the labor government came to power in the United Kingdom and instituted social democracy, that it would lead to fascism. 
but it turns out it's an awfully long way from social welfare to socialism, much less, less to Soviet-style tyranny. Similarly, Milton Friedman was wrong about the inextricable link between economic and political freedom. Just think about recent developments in Chile and China. We've seen places in the world where capitalist free markets have developed without accompanying political freedoms, um, and we could argue vice versa as well. Moreover, we also know from history as well as from recent events from Wall Street to the Gulf of Mexico that free markets require sensible regulation and enforcement both to function as free markets and not to collapse into monopoly capitalism and to avoid unacceptable costs to bystanders. Moreover, there's a profound irony in the arguments that these men made and the actions that they took. Because while we have delayed action on global warming, the problem is getting steadily worse. Many scientists now think that we are reaching or perhaps have even passed key tipping points that could lead to true crises, like the breakup of the West Antarctic ice sheet and many meters of sea level rise. I appreciate that sea level rise is not an issue that you lie awake at night in Kansas worrying about, but those of us in California do. And here's the irony of the story. The longer we wait, the more likely it is that the very intrusive government action that these people most dreaded will, in fact, become necessary. By fostering delay, the merchants of doubt have made it more likely that the very thing they most dreaded will actually come true. Moreover, I would argue that all Americans believe in liberty. Liberals, conservatives, Republicans, Democrats, urban dwellers, country dwellers. No one is an advocate of intrusive government intervention in our lives. None of us want the government to tell us what to do. But as the philosopher Isaiah Berlin pointed out, life is a trade-off, and liberty for wolves can mean death to sheep. I gave this talk a few weeks ago at the Yellowstone, uh, Greater Yellowstone Coalition. I got to this slide, and I thought, ooh, bad metaphor. <laughs> so if anybody can think of a better metaphor, please let me know. All societies accept some limitations on the actions of others, whether it's a red light or a stop sign by your local school, whether it's a uh, mileage limit on the freeway, um, whether it's paying your property taxes. We, have, we all live with limits because without limits, there would be no civil society. There would be no roads and bridges, no hospitals, no schools. There would be chaos. So to conclude, in 1990, Richard Darman, the director of the Office of Management and Budget under President George H.W. Bush, dismissed the concerns of environmentalists derisively, saying, quote, Americans did not fight and win the wars of the 20th century to make the world safe for green vegetables. <laughs> well, we would submit that not only did we not make the world safe for green vegetables, we didn't make it safe for polar bears either, or for Pacific Islanders. And if we don't take action soon, it may not be safe for us either. Now, you notice I try to have a sense of humor about all this despite the difficulty of the subject. Um, so Eric and I always like to end on a happy note or at least a humorous one. Uh, but this next slide is a little hard to read in the back of the room, so I'll read the caption. And it says, sorry, Harold, but I am reducing our carbon footprint. <laughs> Thank you very much.